Hello, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I'm going to talk about JavaScript today. Um, hmm? uh, yeah. First, we'll look at um, uh, why you want to use JavaScript um, and what uh, things you can do with JavaScript. Um, we're looking at some advanced features of the language. Um, uh, we uh, uh, look at some patterns and techniques that are pretty useful when programming with JavaScript. And finally, we'll also see how we can debug JavaScript and um, how we can analyze our code to find possible errors and so on. Why JavaScript? Um, JavaScript is a pretty lightweight language um, compared to some other languages. Um, uh, JavaScript doesn't have a static type system. That may be an advantage. Um, it may also be a disadvantage. Um, the most important reason why you want to use JavaScript is that functions are first class objects. Um, but the ultimate reason is because you have to. Um, you have to use JavaScript because um, that's pretty much the only language that's available in the browser. And uh, if you want to script um, things in the browser, you ultimately have to use JavaScript. Um, there's also some confusion uh, regarding to uh, the uh, DOM, the document object model. Um, the document object model is basically just an API for accessing elements on a web page. Um, the, uh, the DOM is not at all JavaScript specific. Uh, you can also use the DOM uh, with other languages such as uh, PHP, Java, and so on. So um, DOM is not JavaScript, and JavaScript is not the DOM. The DOM has a pretty bad reputation, though, because um, there are some <coughs> incompatibilities between browsers. It has a pretty verbose syntax. For example, you have to use functions or methods like get element by tag name, and they are pretty tedious to write. And uh, because the DOM is rather inconvenient to use, um, you have to write a lot of code to do simple things. Um, next, JavaScript versus browsers. JavaScript originated in Netscape, in the Netscape Navigator as LiveScript. Um, but JavaScript is not at all specific to browsers. You can use JavaScript in uh, many other different um, environments, uh, such as uh, scripting, um, user interfaces, for example, um, all the Mozilla apps are uh, scripted using JavaScript. That means you can modify the user interface uh, or the user interface's actions um, with JavaScript. You can also script Adobe applications with JavaScript. Um, JavaScript was used as a base language for ActionScript, which is in the Flash player by Adobe. Um, you can also use JavaScript on the server side to run server-side applications. And that's what I'm going to show you. Um, OK. There's a website, um, AppChat, that allows you to write server-side applications uh, in JavaScript. And that's a sample application I wrote in like an hour. What it does is. Um, Uh, it pulls in uh, the Twitter feed from users and displays them, for example, like that. Or I can just enter um, another uh, name and it automatically pulls in the Twitter feed and displays it. And that's something you can um, do on the server side. You can also, of course, create much more complicated things. There's even an application a web application framework written in JavaScript that runs on the server that allows you to create, or that is basically a content management system. OK. You can also do other things. Um, for example, you can do a 3D rendering in the browser. That's not that good performance-wise, but it is possible. Um, you can also read IP3 tags from um, MP3 files, for example, by just loading the uh, file in the browser and then um, looking at the uh, binary file and extracting the ID3 tags from it. 
And you can even implement other programming languages in JavaScript. Um, that's what John Resick has done with the processing uh, language. Um, the processing language is a uh, language to um, visualize things. Um, trying to, um, yeah. These are things you can do with the processing language, and um, uh, John Resick has written a parser for that language that um, shows these um, things written in that language here in the browser. Okay, next up, advanced language features. Um, in JavaScript, functions are first-class entities. Um, some might not call functions as advanced, but actually they are in JavaScript um, because you can store functions in variables. You can pass functions as parameters. You can return functions from functions. Um, you can pretty much define functions at any place. You have, um, yeah, um, yeah. Um, functions can contain properties, so um, you can also add a function to a function. Uh, you can create anonymous functions. Um, and JavaScript, of course, supports closures. Uh, what that is, um, uh, we get to that later. Um, a little example. Um, we define a function. The function has one parameter called callback. Um, that parameter has to be a function. And we can just call that function or that parameter function. Then we can return a function from that function. We execute that function and execute the return function right away by putting the, um, uh, the uh, parentheses after the first parentheses. And we pass a function to that function. And uh, what that, is, yeah, OK. That's, that's, thing, uh, that's something you can do in JavaScript. Uh, you can also add a property to, to that function, of course, and um, yeah. Uh, next is um, object orientation in JavaScript. JavaScript does not have a classical object orientation with classes. JavaScript doesn't have classes at all. Um, uh, uh, JavaScript has the concept of prototypal object orientation. That means uh, you can have a function that is a prototype. Um, that function acts as the constructor for the class, and the function, the uh, the constructor function, can have can have a uh, prototype property, which contains further uh, methods. And when you instantiate a new class with new um, with a new operator, you get a new class from that based on that old class. Um, let's look at how this looks in JavaScript. Um, we just define a function. This is the constructor function. Um, we add a prototype to that, um, and we add two methods, bar and bass, here. And uh, we can create a new instance uh, by just writing new foo, and then we can uh, execute the um, methods of that um, object. Um, like I said, a function is a constructor, and uh, the instances create from an, uh, created from another object are um, or have implicit links to the base class. Uh, what that means is um, we just define a function here and a prototype with another uh, method. Uh, we create a new instance, and we can execute the bar function. We add a new method to the prototype, so the base class, and uh, the instance that we created before automatically gets the new um, method. Uh, JavaScript is pretty flexible, and you can also um, extend or add attributes at any time. 
You can even change the, change the language itself. For example, you can um, add a method to the number object. Number objects are pretty much all the um, integers and other numbers used in JavaScript. Uh, we have this Celsius to Fahrenheit function here, which converts the number to uh, Fahrenheit from Celsius to Fahrenheit using this formula. Um, and on the JavaScript console, we just can execute uh, 34 Celsius to Fahrenheit, and we'll get the result back. Uh, the same is possible with, with uh, strings, objects, functions, arrays, and so on. Um, yeah, and null Celsius are 32 Fahrenheits. Next, scope. Um, JavaScript has a lexical scope um, that's also known as static scope. Um, a scope means basically that, um, uh, or no, uh, the scope contains basically everything that is visible when the function is um, defined in JavaScript. So, um, yeah, uh, we'll get to examples later to illustrate that. And in that function, this is the context the function is executed in. Um, that means you can execute a function in different contexts, and based on what context you execute that function in, uh, this is um, <coughs> a element from the uh, document or um, basically something else, and you can um, just mani manipulate this and execute it in different functions, uh, in different environments. Um, yeah, French. Okay. Now let's look at an, at an example. Um, we just have a function here um, and a variable foo. And from that function, we return another function um, which locks or prints that uh, variable foo. Um, and we execute that outer function right away. So bar actually contains the inner function, um, which just prints foo. However, if uh, the inner function is uh, stored in bar, um, it can still access the um, variable foo from the outer function, or that is defined within the outer function, even though um, it is not really uh, visible elsewhere. So you can manipulate foo afterwards, after um, uh, uh, the variable bar contains the return function. And we can just execute bar now, because bar is a function, and we get foo back. And there's no way to change foo anymore. So the uh, scope of the outer function lives until everything is, um, or, or until something in it can still be executed. Since uh, the inner function can still be executed because it is stored in bar, um, the scope is preserved and um, the variables are, are still present. Okay. The scope is on after the outer function returned, even after. Um, let's look at a more complex example. Um, this is just um, um, another table of um, conversion options. Um, just remember this a second because I don't have space on the other slide. Um, okay. Uh, we have that function which we execute right away. Note the parenthesis after the um, uh, bracket. Um, formulas in that function is the um, object I've shown you before. Um, we now loop over each um, item in uh, these formulas um, like that. So, and then we define a new a number prototype for numbers, um, and we just uh, concat concatenate the from the two to create a new function name. So the names are Celsius to Fahrenheit, um, Celsius to Rio Moore, and so on. And, so on. Um, and that number prototype um, is a function that is executed right away, like that. And as parameters, it gets um, the formula from that particular formula uh, from that particular conversion. Um, in that function that is executed right away, we 
um, return a new function that evaluates the formula. And we have to do that because um, when, we, uh, when the loop continues and we don't, ha we, don't, we don't create a new scope with that outer function here, um, from and to are different things. So they basically continue until the end of the object. And to preserve the state, at that particular point, we have to create a new scope. And uh, that's what we do here. We just pass the formula into that inner function. And the very inner function here um, can then evaluate the formula, even though it is executed after the fact. Um, Okay. Um. Ooh, number prototype. Uh. Okay. We will now load it that function. Um. Not a function. Well, hmm. oh, okay. That's that. That's a different file. Then, um, let me check. Ah. And number Fahrenheit to Celsius is uh, that function that just evaluates the formula. And the formula is um, implicitly available in that function because it was in the outer function. can just execute um, 90 Fahrenheit to Celsius. Uh, and it will return the um, temperature in Celsius. Can you make only the Pardon? Um, I could by just printing it in that inner function. Um, um, Okay, I'll just change that here. Okay. No. Okay. When we look at number dot a prototype dot foreign to Celsius. I now added the print, print formula, and 90. Uh, it now prints the formula first and then executes the formula using eval. Um, using eval is not that good, but just, I just use it for that example um, because it was easier. Okay. Um, JavaScript also allows you to uh, use functional style programming for uh, uh, looping through arrays or applying functions to arrays and so on. Um, there's, for example, the for each function um, that allows you to execute a function for each element of an array. There are also many other functions like map or reduce and so on. Um, JavaScript 1.7. Um, JavaScript 1.7 is available since Firefox 2. Um, however, as far as I know, most other browser windows 
uh, don't really support JavaScript 1.7. And even in Firefox 2, you have to specifically enable uh, JavaScript 1.7 by using a special um, a language name in the script tag. Um, uh, one example that is, or uh, one uh, feature that is available in JavaScript 1.7 are uh, generics or um, iterators. For example, we have this Fibonacci function um, that pretty much loops forever, uh, while true loops forever and there's no break whatsoever. Uh, but there's a yield um, statement inside that function. And that means as soon as the first yield statement is reached, it returns that um, uh, it, it returns that value, and the uh, uh, the function or the code that called that Fibonacci function can do whatever it wants with that uh, value, and then it can also request the next value. And so the function execution execution is resumed at the yield statement, and uh, the while loop continues until the next yield statement. Uh, this can be used, for example, like that. Um, uh, in G, G is a new Fibonacci, and um, yeah, we just loop from 1 to 10 and print the next um, G, or the next value that is yielded by that function. That's just one example. There are many other um, uh, extensions to the language in JavaScript 1.7, but you can really use that um, in actual programming. Um, next, patterns and techniques. Um, singletons, or singleton is a pretty popular pattern. However, in JavaScript, that's pretty much just a regular object because you don't have classes. You can just create one object um, that is there that can be instantiated and so on, and that has its own state. Um, that's pretty much a no-brainer in JavaScript. Uh, inheritance is a bit more complicated in JavaScript um, because it has these, uh, this uh, prototypal object orientation. Um, it's still easy nonetheless. Um, we just create a new object with a value and a function that prints the uh, value of this object. Um, then we create another um, function that acts as the constructor, and the prototype of that function is a new object foo. So uh, we basically link the prototype from um, from the bash function to the foo function or, or to the foo object, and then we can manipulate the prototype of bash, um, which just change the value. So the function um, from the um, old from the um, ancestor prints the new value. And when we execute a new foo that bar, it prints foo because um, foo foo's value is foo. And if we uh, do the same with the new bass, it prints bass because the value from the inherited or from the um, derived object is bass. Um, continues. We can also create a better bar function um, that adds um, another string in front of that. Um, and it can still access the um, this value like that. That prints a uh, value that pass. Okay. Um, next up, the decorator. Uh, decorators are pretty useful uh, because oftentimes you uh, find yourself wanting to create a new uh, a new class that is only slightly different from another um, function or from another class. Um, but in JavaScript, you don't really have to create a new full-blown uh, derived object because you can just overwrite methods um, from an instantiated class or from ins an instantiated object. Um, to do that, uh, we have uh, the, or we can extend the function prototype. The function prototypes are the basically the function object. So each function gets a new method named decorate here. Um, we have two parameters, pre and post. And uh, first, we save the this value so that we can um, access um, the this value of the outer function in the inner, the return function. Um, in the return function, we um, execute the um, pre function that is passed as the first parameter uh, with the same um, this. Oh, this should actually be um, old, not this. Or wait, ah oh, no, uh, 
Yeah, but no, that's correct. Okay, then we execute the original function. Um, <coughs> old is the original function. Um, and then we execute the post function. And that way we can um, add a function in front of that function and add a function after that function. Um, our use is um, just create a new um, uh, object with a prototype. Uh, create a new instance of that object. And uh, now we can decorate that function, that pass that bar function, by just passing a new pre function into that. And so whenever pass that bar is executed, first this function is executed, then the original function, and then um, the um, uh, post function would be executed, which is not present here. So when you execute uh, pass that bar message, it first prints pre and then prints message because it first executes that function, then uh, this function with a um, parameter message and prints that message. Um, delegates. Uh, in just, uh, a pretty good pattern is to uh, delegate tasks to another object to not make one object too complex. Um, uh, you can use many different delegate objects. Um, so if you have one task that can be done in many different ways, um, you can just uh, pass a, um, uh, an object to another object or to another function. And that function or object uses that function to do, its, uh, to do certain tasks. For example, um, uh, um, let's, for example, take a slideshow. Um, a slideshow has to load pictures or has to load data for displaying those pictures. Um, when you have like 10 pictures or 20 pictures, that's not a big deal. You can just um, insert it into the page header, for example, and load it. Um, but um, it turns out that there are users who create slideshows with 600 pictures. And if you load 600 pictures or the data for those pictures into the header, um, that's going to be a pretty large page, and that's not what you want. So, um, uh, you can create a simple data source for like small, um, uh, small amounts of data, and uh, that simple data source has just two functions: length, which returns the overall length or the amount of items that is available, and item, which returns a particular item. Um, but you can also um, create a more complex data source object, um, which does uh, calls to the server side. Um, create a new prototype for that function. Um, the length loads um, the data from the server. Um, this is just code I, might, I made up. You uh, might want to use the Ajax functionality provided by the JavaScript library you use or use your own. Um, and the item fetches the new data from the server. Um, the way this is used, uh, we created a new slideshow object. For example, this is named object here, just uh, which takes a data source object. And um, uh, it just loops over those items and does something with these items. For example, display these items. Um, you've got two ways to in or to create an object. Um, first, a simple data source, uh, which is just that object. Or you can create a new data source. Ooh, uh, yeah. Or you can create a new data source object with that URL. And so that um, the slideshow object uh, uses that data source to retrieve its objects instead of just hard coding the source of those objects directly into the slideshow object. Um, uh, you can basically work with two different models um, with delegates, the pull versus the push model. Um, pull is pretty simple. Um, you have an object and a delegate, and the object just calls the delegate and uh, uses the return value. This is called a synchronous call. And um, you can do an asynchronous call. So the object basically just sends a message to the delegate to do something. And uh, when the delegate is finished, it calls another method from the original object um, that uh, 
treats the return value or does something with the return value. Um, this is typically done by um, supplying just a method that does something when the delegate is finished with its action. For example, um, when loading data, um, it is usually better to use an asynchronous call because synchronous calls totally block the client and the user can't even do, can't do anything on the page, can't even scroll. Um, and especially if the network connection is flaky, um, you might have to wait several seconds and that's just not acceptable. This is also why A check is called A check because the first A is asynchronous. Um, a pretty popular pattern are named parameters. Um, now, JavaScript doesn't really have a specific syntax for uh, naming parameters like Ruby does, um, but you can just um, create something yourself, by, uh, which is great that extend functions, which takes an object and variables it should copy into that object, um, which is loop over those uh, new variables and insert it into the object um, like that. So um, if the property is already available, we insert the uh, children into that into the children of that object. Um, if it's not available, we just insert it right away. Um, uh, the way this can be used is uh, create a new function which just takes one parameter instead of like five different parameters in a certain order. Um, it just takes one and extends this. Um, so the new object uh, with the parameters. Um, um, this looks like that. You just create a new object on the fly with position left and start three. And if you have many different parameters for a uh, for a constructor, uh, this is usually the better way to do it because you don't have to remember the order of the parameter or pass null values to omit certain um, parameters and so on. Um, currying. Does someone know what currying is? <laughs> no, okay. Um, currying was invented in uh, 1967 by Haskell Curry, the inventor of the Haskell programming language. Um, and currying is also used in languages like Ruby, Haskell, and Smalltalk. Um, uh, currying is basically a way to uh, pre-configure function parameters and pre-configure the context a function is run in. So you can create derivative functions of another function. Um, yeah, you can also, yeah, alter the context when the function is called, like I said. Um, let's look at um, the code. We'll create a new function prototype uh, function named curry, so each function gets uh, yet another method named curry. So we can basically curry each function now. Um, it takes a single parameter, um, just to find some variables here. This code is pretty complex, and um, if you're interested in it, I suggest looking at the code when you have um, some time, um, because it's uh, not that easy to uh, understand. Um, unfortunately, JavaScript has, um, or yeah, in a function you have the arguments um, variable available, which just contains an array of all arguments passed to that functions. However, um, arguments is not a real array. It looks like an array, but it's not a real array, and you can't use um, all array functions. So you have to. Uh, we just have to create an a real array from that argument um, object uh, by just uh, using that for loop. Um, and from that function, we, we return a new function uh, which adds the um, old parameters. And yeah, I really suggest that you look at that function because um, it's, it's pretty cryptic and it's pretty difficult to understand from just looking at the code. Uh, the best way to really understand that is to experiment um, in a browser or in, in a JavaScript console. Um, uh, what we do here is basically just um, uh, concatenate the parameters from both function calls. Uh, we have two functions calls that um, uh, we have an example later. 
and uh, execute that function by the apply method of that function um, with the parameters, with the concatenated parameters from the outer function call, from the first function call, and the actual function call here. And um, yeah, OK. Uh, let's look at what you can do with that. Um, we just have an add function, which basically just adds two variables together, um, which parses them um, in case they are strings or whatever. Um, but uh, we oftentimes have, uh, or we oftentimes want to add uh, five to a particular number, so we can create a new function add five. Um, the first parameter is the uh, context, and we don't need the context here, so we just pass null. And we create that add function and pass null, uh, or uh, pass 5 as the second parameter. The second parameter here um, will be the first parameter here when the um, add 5 function is executed. Um, so we can basically pre-fill the um, parameters. And the add 5 function now has only just one uh, parameter that is used b, and we can just call add 5 10, and um, it adds 10 to 5 because we pre-configured the parameter or or the first parameter to 5. Um, this is especially necessary or um, useful uh, when you uh, deal with events in the in the browser. Because when an event is executed or when an event function is executed, um, it modifies the this variable, and by just uh, passing a custom this as the first parameter, uh, you can basically fix the this parameter from the call function to a certain value or to your object. Um, yeah, for example, like that, we have a foo function, um, which uh, yeah does something. And when the uh, user clicks on that A link, um, this, is, this is jQuery syntax, by the way, um, but you can do that with pretty much every other JavaScript library. Um, we, uh, we query that foo function uh, with the scope, with this as uh, the string test here. So in that function, uh, this will be test. Um, uh, usually, if you have done uh, uh, event programming in JavaScript before, uh, this will be something else, depending on what the user clicked on. And it's pretty difficult to retrieve the actual object the user um, dealt with. Um, so that's a pretty good way to um, change the context the function is executed in. Um, uh, next up is memoization. Um, this is a pretty useful pattern to uh, save intermediate results when you have um, when you want to calculate things. For example, uh, we take our Fibonacci function again. Um, okay. Uh, the problem with the previous Fibonacci function was that it um, calculated um, most values twice or even more times. Um, because it didn't save intermediate results. And when it needed n minus 1 and n minus 2, it just calculated them um, anew. Uh, but we can pretty easily just store these values. OK, so this function, or uh, uh, yeah, this is a function that's executed right away. And memo will be the, um, the array 0 and 1. These are the um, base values of the the predefined values of the Fibonacci function. Um, in that function, we re, uh, return the function. So the inner function is actually stored in the Fibonacci um, variable out there. Um, so the Fibonacci function takes an n, um, the um, number you want to calculate, of the Fibonacci value of. And uh, now we, what we do is, uh, uh, we look whether we have the um, value or the result for, for n already stored in memo. Um, and if that's not the case, like in this branch, um, we calculate it and store it in memo n. So um, memo n is basically now filled with the result, and we just return the memo n. 
Now, this is the advantage that uh, when you execute that function, it just um, calculates each value once um, and stores it into memo. And when the function is called again, yeah? Uh, I don't get it where the address come from. Uh, you, you have the, end, the end is the parameter for that function. And the, uh, this function is uh, stored in this variable. Yeah, but so, Uh, say it again. Yeah, uh, which is called FIP with, say, 24. Um, and that inner function is evaluated, but the inner function has still access to the memo. And uh, this is done to uh, not pollute the global namespace so that we have lots of different values, which just hide the value from the global namespace. But the uh, inner Fibonacci function that's returned and stored into the outer function or into the outer variable name still has access to that because of the scope. <laughs> okay. Um, we can just now um, execute the Fibonacci function for, say, 24. And uh, when we execute Fibonacci for 8, we don't have to do any calculations at all because. Um, uh, this will uh, be false, this expression. And so we just return memo n because we already calculated it in the previous function call. And we still have stored it in the previous function. So that's faking a static variable. Basically, yeah. Um, Uh, we could do that as well. That was just done to save space. That's all. We could just have um, uh, defined that in the uh, outer function. Um, Yeah, okay. This is the uh, code. <coughs> when we look at the FIP function, um, we now just have the inner function, um, which has still access to the outer memo variable. Um, yeah. When we execute um, that, yeah. Too much. <laughs> huh? um, I actually tried that with much larger values and I didn't get that error. Um, <laughs> sorry? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, it usually works, or we can just increase the um, stack so that we can have much deeper recursion. Um, okay, uh, that's just an example anyway, so. Sorry, what's the interpreter you got there? Is that or? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's um, the, um, there are different JavaScript consoles. Um, uh, there's one from the Mozilla, uh, no, there are actually two from the Mozilla project. There's Reno, um, which is uh, rather old, and there's CMonkey uh, from the Mozilla project. You can just download that from the Mozilla web page. If you um, search for CMonkey, um, you'll find it. Um, and there's one from um, WebKit. Uh, when you just download WebKit nightly, it has um, a, uh, a binary called JSC. Uh, which also has a JavaScript console. Unfortunately, it doesn't um, uh, support some um, things, so um, CMonkey is probably the most convenient console. Or you can just... Um, 
Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm in Spider Monkey, sorry, yeah. Um, Spider Monkey is the JavaScript engine from, um, uh, from Mozilla, or from the current Mozilla builds. Um, okay. Okay, uh, let's look at how we can debug and analyze JavaScript code. Um, first, there's Firebug. I think most people know Firebug. If you don't, you really have to check it out because um, it contains a JavaScript console that is uh, really useful and, and um, has lots of features. Um, you can just lock things or print things um, instead of alerting all the time. Uh, when you debug, um, you also have a DOM inspector, um, and it has a JavaScript debugger, and um, you can just step through your JavaScript code, hover over variable names, and see what the values of these are, set breakpoints, and so on. And um, it's uh, pretty convenient to use, and um, definitely a better way to shotgun debugging with alerts and so on. Um, it also allows you to profile JavaScript activity, so you can just click on profile, um, do some things on the page, um, and uh, you click on stop profiling, and it tells you what functions have been executed, how long they have taken, and so on. And so that's, uh, if your JavaScript application is pretty slow, uh, that's probably a good way to find bottlenecks, because you can see how long um, each function call takes, and so on. Um, can get that at getfirebug.com. Um, Firebug Lite is a JavaScript console for um, other browsers. Unfortunately, it doesn't have profiling, um, and it doesn't really have all the advanced features um, Firebug has, but it's getting better. I think they added something like a DOM inspector in the recent um, versions, um, but it still doesn't do your laundry. Um, you can obtain that at getfirebug.com slash light.html. Um, yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, if you want to debug JavaScript in Internet Explorer, uh, there's a free um, software tool called Wishful Web Developer 2008 Express Edition. So the actual name is Microsoft Visual Web Developer 2008 Express Edition. Um, it's free. Um, however, um, uh, free means that you don't have to pay for it. It's not really free software. Um, uh, you get basically get a uh, JavaScript debugger for Internet Explorer, um, you, and you can just step through, uh, step through the code like in Firebug. Um, it's free. Uh, but you have to mess with it a bit to get it to work because it, uh, the JavaScript debugger is to debug ASP.NET um, JavaScript. You just have to load um, or you just have to execute a blank page in Visual Web Developer 2008 Express Edition and um, then load your custom URL into the, in, into the started Internet Explorer and then you have the um, uh, debugging session with um, this piece of software. Uh, you can download that at uh, this URL, or you can just type that into search engine, and you'll probably find it. Um, Web Dev Helper is um, also an extension for Internet Explorer. It also pro provides a JavaScript console, which um, um, yeah, is useful. Um, it logs HTTP calls. For example, if you um, have a uh, HX Havery application, uh, you can inspect all the HTTP calls to the server. It also includes a JavaScript backtracer, so if something fails, you can see what functions have been called before and what the stack trace is and so on. Um, you can download that at this URL. And the last tool is uh, JavaScript Lint. Um, a Lint is a tool for analyzing code. Basically, there are Lints for other languages as well. Um, uh, JavaScript Lint discovers sloppy coding, so um, JavaScript is um, a pretty generous word when it comes to um, coding. For example, you can just leave off semicolons if you have a line break after that command. However, I wouldn't really recommend that because you run into all kinds of problems when you leave off the semicolons. Um, 
uh, you can uh, run JavaScript Lint as a command line application, um, and that allows you to um, use JavaScript Lint, for example, as a pre-commit hook for a revision control system that forbids checking in JavaScript files which contain errors or which um, uh, have missing semicolons and so on. And that's probably a good way to ensure that your JavaScript style um, is uh, not or is, is, is good. Um, JavaScript Lint can be downloaded here. There's also a TextMate bundle for TextMate users um, that just performs a JavaScript Lint on every, um, uh, whenever you save the file. And it displays to you whether you have warnings and errors and so on. Okay. Um, these are some of the sources I have used. Um, there are a lot more uh, sources for um, uh, these information, uh, but I couldn't remember all of them. Okay, so that's pretty much uh, that pretty much concludes it. Uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, how do you rate uh, the maintainability of JavaScript code? Because all the fancy stuff is pretty hard to understand hmm. when you're an external developer or when you come to a team or even if you've written it uh, a month ago and you see it and say, oh, um. Uh, like in every project, maintainability depends very heavily on documentation. So um, if you uh, describe what the code does in your own language, um, you probably have uh, uh, a much easier time understanding that code. Um, if you don't comment your JavaScript code at all, it's probably, it's probably difficult to understand. But that's pretty much true for every code if it's not simple um, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and there's this other thing that, I mean, a lot of patterns in JavaScript look like really bad hacks or like <laughs> tricks and stuff, but this is, some, this is commonly misunderstood because it's not like um, somebody's trying to hack a problem. It's just using the concepts of the language, like, for instance, closures and stuff like that, to achieve the search and functionality. It's, it's not a hack. And once you, you got to understand these concepts of, of JavaScript, well, then it's much more readable and more understandable than, than it looks at the first stuff. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you showed a specific example of memorization, yeah. whereas with Corrine you showed a general recipe. How would you turn memorization into a Generosity to memorize any function? Um, there is a, um, uh, you can actually generalize memorization. Um, uh, for example, in this book, um, it is shown how to um, um, uh, generalize that. You just create a function prototype method um, that allows you to add memorization to any function. So it basically checks if the function has already been called with that parameter. And if that's the case, it just returns the value because it has saved this uh, return value. And um, yeah, that's definitely possible. So generalize is just as easy as a short with Curring. Um, uh, Curring is actually something slightly different. So um, uh, uh, Curring is not about remembering the return value or, I just yeah. I it generalizes just as Yeah, easy. yeah, yeah. Um, not really. Um, I can show something about yeah. um, Well, I looked at several browsers, and mm, the main problem I observed in well, all browsers, but um, the use of Firefox, was that memory was like not actually free after nor the execution of the script, nor um, the closing of the tab and sometimes not even closing the window um, would free that memory. So uh, Firefox 3 was the first browser where we actually observed um, the reduction of memory footprint when the, once the script uh, was done and where you read memory um, explicitly inside the script. But it's, well, memory leaks are quite a, quite a big deal. 
especially when dealing with strong objects and stuff like that, because you get uh, circular references and uh, several environments where you might forget to uh, give reference to a dumb object. Mm. And the dumb object float pretty much in the, um, in the memory. Yeah, but that's pretty much a, a, a browser or an implementation issue and not really an issue of the language. Is there really no way of printing out the value except alert unless you use Firebug or something? Um, where would you print that to? Yeah, the, the console. There is a JavaScript yeah. um, in the browser where you can see all the errors, but without then writing an error, just putting the um, value there. Is that really not possible? I, I'm not aware of a way in um, Mozilla. Um, Safari has a console method or console.log method that allows you to log to the console. Um, that's, that's built in. It's possible that there is something for Firefox as well. Yeah, this is standard function is called dump. Just have to enable that it output it to the command line and make it from. Okay, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you have a word on the eval function uh, regarding, uh, let's say, memory consumption or error tracking, like when you eval large parts of scripts? What's your experience? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? The JavaScript eval function. Yeah. It's nowadays widely used, like in our project, we use it to to load scripts dynamically from the server and to leave other scripts. So, but we, in, uh, before loading, we cannot determine how large the script will be. So, we, uh, is there any boundaries, um, any restrictions? I don't know. Um, however, um, there's a way to execute or to load scripts uh, without using eval. Um, I think jQuery has something like that, and possibly other libraries have something like that as well, um, which doesn't use eval, because um, like in every language, eval might be necessary or convenient sometimes, but actually don't need that. But I can't really um, say anything about the memory consumption. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. You were just uh, listing available debuggers. I think you could add that the development, the developer builds of Safari also have increasingly powerful debuggers. Yeah. Um, uh, they also have a JavaScript console, which um, also allows you to look at the JavaScript code. I don't, I'm not sure whether um, Drosera is already included into the Safari or WebKit. Um, I think it's still a standalone app for debugging Safari or I have JavaScript. A, a download from the developer site is uh, integrated. It's okay. Maybe web developer or so. And source link debugger, pretty nice. It's okay. still evolving, but. Uh, I haven't have looked at that yet, yeah. but yeah. Okay, thanks. Hmm. And can you give us an overview of available JavaScript libraries and why would I use it? Um, um, I, don't, I don't think that I'm the right person to do that because I pretty much exclusively use jQuery as a JavaScript library. Um, uh, there are other JavaScript libraries like Doge Show, uh, YUI, a Prototype, um, XJS, and so on. But um, it, it really depends on what you already know and what you want to do. And, um, I don't think there's a general recommendation f uh, which fits every use case. So there's there's no definite answer I can give you. Sorry. Okay. Thanks for attending.